Lean Six Sigma certification in training. This is the video of the measure phase, module three, section two. So the measure phase identifies the critical inputs and process variables and prioritizes them according to their impact upon the process output to further the team's understanding if it hasn't been prepared in the previous step a detailed as is map is developed and information is collected on cycle time process yield and working process here's the measure checklist now at this point you should pause the video to read through this or go to the deck in your documents in the student area and read through this print this out and read through this so the measure steps first of all we're going to select a project and identify the inputs for data collection we're going to develop a measurement plan and prepare and collect the data then we'll ensure there's a toll gate review in place step four Measurement is at the heart of Six Sigma, or Lean Six Sigma. It may well have prompted the project. It will certainly be needed to understand the current situation. To manage by fact, you'll need to quantify and verify possible causes. In developing solutions, you will need data to help determine the most effective approach, and you'll need measures in place as a prompt for further improvement opportunities. Measurement shouldn't be a hassle. The data you collect should be seen as important, it should be seen as helpful. It needs to be easy to collect and understand. It must be meaningful in that it will provide timely signals. And it must be presented in a way that will make interpretation appropriate. It should stimulate questions and actions. Ensure that you speak with data. This enables us to separate what we think is happening from what is really happening, conform or disprove pre preconceived ideas and theories, establish baseline performance, identify and understand variation, and also measure the impact of change to a process. So, key outputs. In completing step four, you should produce at least the following. A complete list of key process output variables or KPOVs related to the project CTQs or critical to qualities. Complete list of key process input and process variable that relate to the KPOV and in some instances require further investigation through data collection and analysis. Some possible tools for this would be cause and effect matrix, input output analysis, cause and effect analysis, fishbowl and Ishikawa, or process FMEA, or failure modes and effects analysis. Now the different types of measures. There are two types of measures we need to collect, output measures and input or process measures. The output measures should be derived directly from the CTQs identified earlier. Input or process measures that affect the output measures can be identified using some techniques we'll discuss shortly. So outputs are a function of input and process variables. So if Y is your output, it's critical to customer satisfaction and sustainable growth of risk. F is the function or the interrelationship cause and effect between variables and outputs. And X are your process and input variables, so variables that must be controlled to determine why. Here we can see the funnel effect. So define your critical to qualities for the project, define your KPOVs that reflect the CTQs, identify the variables that, variables that may affect the KPOVs, screen these then analyze the results to determine the real critical variables good place to start is with the output measures a good output measure represents the voice of the customer and expresses the voice of the process we can see how capable the process is of meeting the customer's critical to quality requirements upstream changes in the input or process variables will be reflected 
in the output measures. The thing to be aware of is beware of the average. So there may be no overcrowding on trains when you take it over a month and include between midnight and 6 and 7 a.m. and quiet times of the day. But you measure it at peak times in rush hours, then you can be damn sure there is some overcrowding on the trains. Also look at what the customer sees. So we've listened to the voice from the customer and developed the CTQs, but remember to listen with your eyes as well as your ears. What does the customer see? Certainly the effect of averages, but what else? Understand what the customers see. So how do they use our product or service? Where do our outputs fit into their processes? What do they measure and how do they do it? How do they measure us? And will their data match ours? So capture what the customer sees, the entire distribution of Y values or outputs. Understand the outside in view. So don't just look at your part of the process. Look at the overall. Look at how your part interacts and influences the other parts of the process. And develop your output measures. So a cause and effect matrix can be used to evaluate potential measures for KPOVs, for CTQs. Templates for all these tools can be found in the student centre. Cause and effect matrix can enhance to take into account relative importance of CTQs. So you can score and weight these. Now for the X's or the inputs. So we've, dus dis we've discussed how to identify KPOVs that relate to key customer requirements. Now we need to identify the KIPV that most influence these KPOVs. There are several tools we can use, as we shall see shortly, but they all do more or less the same job. Use a structure to identify all the possible variables. Rank and prioritize the variables to produce a list of the key few. One needs to make a call to deal with these directly or to collect data to prove or refute the significance of the variable. So input and in-process variables. So X's are a source of variation. Variation causes defects. X's must be under control to prevent defects. Root cause of defects is the variation of X's. Y's are the outputs of processes and include failure modes of processes. Defects are also outputs of a process step. Measurement and capability studies will be performed on the potential key inputs. Input-output analysis allows you to identify potentially all the X's. If you do input-output analysis for the whole process, you may have a rather large list. So think about performing this around only the key areas of your process. Possibly identified from Pareto or Value Stream Analysis. So the steps in performing an input-output analysis map the process, identify all input and outputs. An output may be an input for a subsequent step. If using our default, input should also include controls and mechanisms. Identify all input variables and classify those input variables. Next step of the IO analysis, your controllable inputs or C's. These can be changed, sometimes called knob variables, your noise inputs or N. These are difficult or impossible to control or choose not to. Standard operating procedures, S. These are the procedure for running a process. Your critical inputs, capital X. These are the X's that have been statistically proven to impact the process Y's or outputs. Your desired outcome is that you've identified potential process input variables. Again, there are templates for this in the student center, in the template folder. Here's an example of your IO analysis. And some of the answers for that IO analysis. 
Next, we'll look at XY matrix or cause and effect matrix. This can be used again, but now to prioritize the process inputs or processes themselves. Again, there is a template for this in the student center. FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis. It's another root cause identification tool. It can be used to identify the failure modes of either a process step or a process input. It does not focus on a Y or an output, but instead provides a complete and systematic risk analysis for the entire process under investigation. It's an excellent tool, but should be used with caution. It's probably best left to the improve stage to error proof the 2B process. Here's an FMEA worksheet. Again, there is a template for this in the student center. So when we look at going from cause to effect. We're looking at the cause, which is the material or process input, the failure mode within that process step, and then the effect. So what is the effect of that to the external process or the customer? And what controls can we put in place around those? Once we look at an we're looking at an FMEA, we look for the risk priority number. This is produced by ranking the severity, the probability of occurrence, and how likely we are to be able to detect it. These are then multiplied together. Um, these are ranked from 1 to 10. These give you then your risk priority number. There is a, a separate module on FMEAs later in this part of the course. Here's some example FMEA criteria. Uh, I would recommend that you amend these to reflect whatever business you're working in uh, because a 1 and a 10 may not be the same for your business as it is in these examples. So again your detection scores at various levels of the process. Um, this will determine how critical it is that whether you detect it early in the process or late in the process and that will determine your, your scores for detection. Next we'll look at cause and effect analysis or Fishbone or Ishikawa. This is another root cause identification tool. This provides a structure to help distinguish, group and display the root causes of a problem. So how do we go about carrying out cause and effect analysis? Label the main bone with the observed effect or issue under review, for example, the big Y or the big output. Select the most suitable categories for the side bones. Identify through brainstorming the major causes or contributing factors and label the smaller bones with these. Identify causes or contributing factors and add these as smaller bones to the major causes. Keep going until all potential causes are shown. Categorise and rank potential causes. Decide what causes need further investigation. An example of your fishbone or Ishikawa template is shown here. You can also rank these when you've got to some of your root causes in terms of the impact and the level of control that we have. So when we look at reducing complexity, so these tools have a propensity to generate long lists of candidate PIVs. So try using a combination of techniques to reduce complexity and narrow the focus. For example, use a cause and effect matrix to identify a few critical processes. Perform an input output analysis around the critical processes and use another cause and effect matrix to identify KPIVs. It's all about getting an appropriate balance. So when looking at the input measures, assess the performance of suppliers, record activity volumes. You're looking at your in-process measures, look at the performance of internal customers and suppliers, unit and cycle time performance, identify value and non-value adding activities. Your output measures, so how well are we meeting those critical to qualities and what are your typical output measures, what, what will they look at 
in terms of speed and error rates. So this is all about getting the balance of measures right, understanding how they interrelate. If your measures aren't right, they will drive wrong behaviours. So the, there's no right answer in terms of how many measures you have, but focus on what's important. So a guideline would be one to three measures in each of the categories. So in terms of quality, cost and delivery. Next, we're going to look at developing the measurement plan. So plan how, where and when to collect or process measures using operational definitions and a sample strategy. In the ideal world, the ASIS process should be capturing pertinent management information. All the analysts would have to do is acquire it. In reality, most organisations collect only a limited amount of information and normally only around output measures if they collect anything at all. The team is most likely to have to collect or derive its own measures. So in completing this step, you should produce at least the following. A complete and unambiguous operational definition and data collection plan for the key process output variables. A complete and unambiguous operational definition and data collection plan for the key process input and process variable of the KPIV measures. A few tools applicable in this step are measurement plan, sampling strategy and sampling sizes. Also a measurement systems analysis. Your measurement plan would contain the operational definition for each metric identified in step 4. There is no right or wrong but a suggested template is shown as an example. An operational definition ensures that everyone has a common understanding of the measures to be collected. It provides a clear, concise description of the measurement and the process by which it is to be collected. Again, here are some of the uh, things that should be on the, your measurement plan template. You want to pause the video here to just read through these or go through these in your actual slide deck that you can download. So when you're developing a measurement plan, it's often best to work backwards. So work out how you're going to analyze the data. Knowing the analysis requires, required allows you to define what needs to be collected. So the type of data to be collected and the analysis to be undertaken determines the sample size required. So the data and the sample size required will dictate how you go about actually collecting the data. So if you don't know how you're going to analyse and display your data, then you may not be able to do anything useful with it once it's collected. So your different types of data, uh, again, you can go through this in your own time, uh, rather than me reading this to you, you can take a little bit of time to, to study and understand this. So your different types of data can be continuous or discrete. Your orders of measurement can be described as nominal, ordinal, interval or ratio. So the type of data available will dictate how you can display the collected data and what inferential statistical tests are available to you. So there are two main types of analysis. You've got descriptive st statistics, uh, examples of these are Pareto or histograms, run charts, pie charts, etc. And then you've got inferential statistics parametric and non-parametric. Make sure you're collecting the data in the right way to be able to perform the correct analysis. Data is only as good as the process that measures it. So variation in the data collection process reduces the effectiveness of our decision making. Determine factors that could cause measurement of an item to vary. One could test the measurement system to ensure consistency and stability. If you come across this, find ways to reduce the problem. So collecting only a representative selection of the available or potentially available data and analyze it to draw conclusions about the total data. So this is what we call a sample. So why do we sample? It's often too difficult or expensive to collect and analyze all the data. Sometimes collecting the data destroys it as in wine testing, sutures or drop testing phones. Valid conclusions could often be drawn from a comparatively small amount of data. 
So how do we know we've got a representative sample? So for conclusions to be valid, the samples must be representative. The data you collect fairly represents all the data. So no systematic differences between the data you collect and the data you don't collect. Every item stands an equal chance of being included. So if you don't understand the segmentation factors of the population, you could take an inappropriate sample. So how representative are the following sampling situations? The team is studying the total cycle time for large loans. To develop an understanding of the current cycle time, they sample cases from the London office where data was readily available. So here we could have geographical variation. A credit card team is interested in improving statement accuracy. They decided to sample and pull every 20th statement processed over the next month. A loans team is interested in improving mortgage quotation accuracy. They decided to collect a sample of quotations processed from 2 to 5 p.m. every day for the next five days. So just pause the, pause the video here and have a look at what possible variation you could see from carrying out sampling in that situation. In terms of process sampling, so the purpose of this is to measure, analyze, or control the process. Examples of this are establishing baseline performance, identifying opportunities for improvement, or ongoing monitoring and control. Systematic sampling from a process so taking a regular sample, for example, every third or tenth item, this can be relatively easy to do, but may introduce bias. So taking a regular sample, for example, um, it, it's important to keep things in a time sequence when you're doing it this way. Subgroup sampling from a process. So this is about taking a regular and random sample of five items every hour or two, or every day, for example. sampling from a population. So this could mean looking at a customer base, could mean looking at a population of something that's been processed for example. Loan applications, voting intentions of particular groups, buying patterns of potential customers, reasons for defaulting on mortgage payments. So for company X what could this be? So the sample size will be determined by the variation within the population and the level of confidence required from the result. One option is to use the standard deviation when we're looking at measuring variation. One standard deviation represents the average distance any one item is away from the overall mean. So we can say for example that the average call length is 3 minutes and the standard deviation is 30 seconds. But what does that mean? So the standard deviation equals 30 seconds and the mean equals three minutes, then we know that the average call length is three minutes, almost two thirds of the calls take between 2.5 and 3.5 minutes, around 95% take between two and four minutes, and 99.73 take between 1.5 and 4.5 minutes. The diagram below shows the likely percentage of cases within each band of standard deviation or sigma values. The standard deviation represents the average distance any one item is from the overall average. So we'll examine the standard normal distribution later during the analysis stage. So here's the standard deviation formula. So for a sample, it looks like this, and for a population, like this. So using n minus 1 makes an allowance for the fact that we are looking at a sample and not the whole population. In practice though, once a sample size is over 30, there is very little difference between using n or n minus 1, where n is your sample size. Calculating the sample size. So we're going to look at two different formulae. The first is used when you want to find out an average cycle time, for example, where n is the sample size needed, 
S is the standard deviation, D is the precision, Z is the value for the normal distribution for a certain confidence level. So Z equals 1.96 for 95% confidence. So what if you don't know the standard deviation? Ah, Catch-22 is alive and well. So to estimate sample size, you need to know the standard deviation. You need to have some idea of the amount of variation in the data because as the variability increases, the necessary sample size increases. But if you haven't sampled anything yet, how can you know the standard deviation? So some options for estimating standard deviation. Use a control chart from a similar process. Collect a small sample, so this might be as small as 25 to 30 items, and calculate your standard deviation. As a last resort though, not really recommended, take an educated guess based on your process knowledge, memory and experience. So when we talked about a control chart, this is an SPC tool, uh, or a statistical process control tool. We'll look at SPC during the control stage. So when we're talking about precision, precision is how narrow you want the range to be for your estimate. For example, estimate cycle time within two days, estimate percent, de percent defective within 3%, and we're talking plus and minus. Use the symbol D for delta to represent precision. So how confident are you? If D equals two, so the estimate is within plus or minus two days, Precision is equal to half the width of a confidence interval. So the width of the confidence interval is four days. If your sample of data shows a mean average of 50 days, then you are 95% confident the interval from 48 days to 52 days contains the average cycle time. The larger the sample size, the better the precision. So how much precision you need depends on the business impact of using the estimate, but what can you afford? Your telephone call centre usually answers 15,000 calls each day. You want to time a sample of calls to determine the average call length. What do you need the information for? And does your estimate have to be within 5 minutes, 1 minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds or 7.5 seconds? Suppose you want to estimate the average length of incoming phone calls within one minute. What sample size do you need? Historical data shows a typical standard deviation equals three minutes. So the equation for that is below. So your sample size would be 36. So increasing the accuracy means a bigger sample. Using the same formula and standard deviation information, how many calls do you need to sample to get an estimate of 7.5 seconds? How many calls do you need to sample to get an estimate within 30 seconds? So remember to put the data you have into the same units, so either minutes or seconds. So just pause the video at this point and do those calculations. So calculating the sample size from an attribute data point of view. So a second formula is used where we want to estimate a proportion or percentage. This might relate to error rates or customer satisfaction for example. Again the formula assumes a 95% confidence level but let's look at it in a little more detail. Sample sizes change significantly according to the p-value. So the largest sample size will be when p equals 0.5 or 50%. If you have no idea what P might be, assume it's 0.5. At worst, you'll sample more than was necessary. So what is the sample size required to estimate the defect rate with 95% confidence when you expect it to be around 10% defective and you want the estimate to be within 3%? So the formula is shown here. and your sample size would be 400. So one more exercise here for you. What is the sample size required to estimate the defect rate with 95% confidence when you expect it to be around 10% defective 
and you want the estimate to be within 1%. Just take a couple of minutes and carry out that calculation. Okay, sampling from a limited or finite population. Sample size formulas assume the sample size n is small relative to the population, capital N, but if you are sampling more than 5% of the population, then it's n divided by capital N, and that is greater than 0.05. So this may be more than you need, and you can adjust the sample size with the finite population formula shown here. So sample size for specific techniques. So sample size formulas were developed for well-defined static populations. Now these can be applied to a stable process. As a rule of thumb, the following minimum sample sizes should be applied. When you look at mean, mode or medium, 10. Standard deviation, 30. Proportion defective, 100. Frequency plot, 50. Pareto, 50. Control chart, 20. Scatter diagram, 25. Sigma level 30. In summary, sampling enables good analysis with small amounts of data, but your samples must be representative of the population or process. Practical issues are important, especially in terms of logistics, time and cost, and determining sample sizes and ensuring they are free from bias may need some specialist support. Next we're looking at preparing and collecting data. So you plan the work, <clears throat> now it's time to work the plan. So the final step of the measure phase is to actually collect and record your data in accordance with your plan. But now you should be confident that you'll be collecting data that can be meaningfully interpreted, definitions are consistent and well understood, data collection is not onerous and you've adopted an appropriate sampling strategy. So your key outputs. <clears throat> In completing step 6, you should produce at least the following. All necessary collection forms and training materials for the subsequent data collection. A database of process measures collected and verified in accordance with your measurement plan developed in step 5. Some of the possible tools. <coughs> a few tools are applicable to this step. So, data collection forms. The options for these are tally charts, check sheets, concentration diagrams. So in terms of your data collection, communicate the what and the why. Train the how, the where and the when. Error proof the process. Oversee the start of the data collection process. Confirm the operational definitions are clearly understood. Check and balance. Does the data seem sensible? So follow the PDCA process. Plan your data collection, do it, then check it, and then go back, revisit it. Because unfortunately, common sense isn't that common. So what you think may be really straightforward, you may need to go back and revisit several times just to error-proof it as much as you possibly can. So some data collection forms. So creating a standard form helps define the data collection procedures, ensure that different people collect the, the data in the same way, and it makes it easier to keep track of the data. So remember, it's a process and needs to be managed and improved, just like any other process. So check the measurements are stable. <coughs> Make sure the procedures remain consistent. Check and balance, so does the data look sensible? And how can this be improved? So data collection costs time and money. So make sure you get it right. So begin with the end in mind. So what data and what will you do with it? How will you collect it? How will you analyse and present it? How will you make it tell the story you want it to tell? Think about the segmentation up front. So operational definitions, training and testing. These will help ensure the data is accurate and collecting data is a process that can also be improved. So in summary, 
We've gone through step four, selecting your project Y and identify axis for data collection. We've developed the measurement plan, we've prepared and collected the data. Then we're going to the toll gate review. Other resources you can find online will be yellow, green, black and master black belt certification courses and exams. All fully accredited from ourselves beyond Lean Limited, a registered training and consultancy company in the United Kingdom. And we also offer consultancy and training services. You can find more information at beyondlean.com or lean6sigmacertification.com. Thank you.